Afternoon, everybody. So in line with the shifting focus theme, um, I'm going to talk about where to focus um, in the space of regional variation with the use of a number of different tools. So before we can even consider performing a regional analysis, we're going to need some baseline information. So the old views and ways of analysis by using the province and the uh, city of healthcare providers doesn't necessarily allow for proper insights to be uh, derived, especially in terms of member-specific behavior. So we're gonna need definitions of different regions within uh, South Africa. We're going to need to know to which regions these members belong, and we're going to need some way to categorize claims experience. When accessing healthcare, we can see that members typically visit primary healthcare providers within a relatively close proximity to their place of home or work. So when accessing healthcare, we see that members typically visit primary healthcare providers within a relatively close proximity to their home or place of work. They are willing to travel further distances for specialized levels of care and willing to travel even further distances to access tertiary levels of care. So, we can subdivide South Africa beyond the provincial borderlines. We can subdivide South Africa into our primary level regions, secondary regions, and tertiary regions. So starting with the first view, so our tertiary regions, we can define or split South Africa into tertiary regions based on tertiary levels of care. So the graphic shown here provides region outlines that have been derived and defined using healthcare referral and utilization patterns. Members seeking tertiary level of care, such as hospital facilities. So with members willing to travel greater distances for these services, we can see that the tertiary regions can be quite vast. So these regions are not necessarily correlated with our provincial boundaries, as we can see in the and we frequently see members crossing provincial boundaries, um, access secondary and uh, provincial boundaries aren't that important for real world healthcare seeking analyses and we actually have to look at how people behave. So these uh, tertiary regions can be further subdivided into uh, secondary regions which are defined as regions where members access secondary levels of care, such as specialist providers. So as can be seen from the graphic, the uh, secondary regions are uh, smaller uh, and more plentiful than the tertiary regions um, as their subdivisions, and they're indicative of the shorter referral patterns and utilization patterns that we see for secondary levels of care. So these secondary levels of care can be divided into primary regions, which are defined as areas where members access primary health care services. Level declines or supply of providers necessarily increases, the regions become smaller and more plentiful. We then further subdivide into our secondary regions uh, and then lastly into our primary regions. So in total, we have 23 uh, tertiary regions, 66 secondary regions, and 135 primary regions. So now we've completed the uh, regional definition part of the process, so we'll just uh, put a, a little tick next to that and uh, move on to the, uh, the next section of the uh, presentation, which speaks to the, uh, to the member allocation. So now that we have definitions for our regions, we need to go about allocating our lives to these particular regions. Seems like quite a tedious process when we have the residential details of those members. So why don't we use postal addresses, for example, which are provided by members when registering with a scheme? So there are a couple of reasons that we don't necessarily use the uh, postal codes which are provided by, by the members. So starting with uh, the first one, which is the uh, medical scheme addresses, which are provided typically at a, a policy level. So a single address, address is then used for uh, all members or, or beneficiaries on, on that policy. Um, and that poses a problem when members or uh, dependents don't live at home, which is often obviously the case with adult dependents. 
in addition, um, medical scheme addresses are not always necessarily um, reliable, and nor are they necessarily kept up to date. So, for example, I know that my medical aid doesn't have my latest physical address on the policy. Um, and then lastly, um, postal codes um, sometimes cover very large geographical areas and therefore are not necessarily uh, useful um, or helpful in any way. So, for example, postal code 7090 in uh, the Northern Cape covers an area of uh, 15 and a half thousand square kilometers. So, uh, not particularly useful when trying to do uh, regional analysis. So, reliance on postal codes, um, not necessarily an option when allocating members to, uh, to uh, specific regions. So, an alternative is to use the uh, claims data, which is submitted by, uh, by members. So, in theory, as we said, members are likely to access primary care, which is pretty close to where they work or to where they, uh, where to they live. So, in this way, we can allocate a member to a primary region, um, and then by default, we know their secondary and their tertiary regions. So, primary healthcare services include disciplines such as our GPs, our dentists, pharmacies, and um, optometrists there. So, for each primary healthcare interaction, we map the visits using the practice's geographical coordinates, um, and then these visits are weighted by the um, duration since the visit, with uh, more recent visits being allocated a, a higher weight. So, the result of this is a set of GPS coordinates um, based on the claims data that's been submitted and received. So, we've got our longitude and our latitude there, each of the dots representing a, a, healthcare, um, a healthcare interaction. So, using the GPS coordinates of these uh, interactions, we can derive the geometric mean, which is uh, represented there by the uh, pretty pink dot there in, in the middle. And the advantage of using the uh, ge uh, geometric mean is that it's not significantly skewed by the inclusion of um, outlier claims. So, for example, there we've got a, a, a claim which occurred quite far away from all of the other interactions, top right-hand corner, and we can see how the geometric mean shifted very slightly um, going from the pink to the, um, to the orange dot there. So now that we've completed the member allocation part of the process, we uh, will just put a little tick next to that and move on to how we go about categorizing different types of, of claims. So before we start looking into tertiary level experience, such as uh, hospital admission rates or readmission rates, cost per admissions, those types of analyses, we need a way to group and to classify our hospital admission types. So the Insight uh, Diagnosis Related Grouper is, is well placed to do this, and it is one of the most widely used DRGs in, uh, in the industry. So the DRG groups hospital admissions using the uh, ICD-10 codes, which are submitted on the, uh, on the claims, and it also uses the CCSA codes, which have also been uh, submitted on those hospital admissions where applicable. So a couple of examples there of some ICD-10 codes and some CCSA codes there, um, and I have checked some of those are actually used in our, in our claims experience in terms of the ICD-10 codes up there. So the DRG follows a number of complex uh, ordinal rules um, to allocate hospital admissions to firstly to admission uh, classes, so either our surgical, our metric, or our obstetric classes there. Um, and then uses the um, ICD-10 codes and CCSA codes to allocate them to MDCs and step down into higher levels of specificity with the base DRGs. So uh, additional ICD-10 codes, which speak to perhaps complications or, or comorbidities, drive um, uh, hospital admissions into higher levels of specificity, which are uh, categorized by the, uh, the DRG. So having looked then at uh, ways to group hospital admissions, we now focus on our last point there, which was uh, ways on uh, grouping different uh, claims experiences there. So Insight, in collaboration with PPO Serve, uh, have developed an Insight grouper called the EPG, which groups encounters with healthcare providers into coherent and clearly definable episodes of care. 
So the grouper utilizes a blend of, of clinical and actuarial and data science IP when defining and allocating episodes for, for claims. So going through a, uh, a real-world example, so we've got a couple of pharmacy claims, some radiology claims, uh, we've got two hospital admissions, two GP consults there, uh, pathology and some physiotherapy claims. So the EPG allows us to group claims into specific episodes of, of care, so as shown with the purple, the red and the, uh, the blue groupings there. So it uses clinical coding, um, uh, medication, ATC classes, and RPL codes to uh, clinically define the episodes of, uh, of care. So we can see a couple of different uh, episodes that um, overlap each other in, in terms of time, uh, which the episode grouper allows us to do is have a couple of episodes that run concurrently. So when looking at um, constructing an episode, uh, only a face-to-face -face encounter can start or, or extend uh, an episode. So we've got, for example, our, our GP consult over there, which uh, triggers the start of um, a healthcare episode. And once an episode has been initiated, uh, the grouper looks back in time to see if any previous claims can be associated uh, to the episode. So medications that could be associated to, uh, to an episode are identified through the use of, of ATC classes, and our hospital-related uh, admissions or claims are also considered if they can be linked to an open episode of care. So the EPG logic is uh, continuously applied to determine if new claims form part of, of an episode. Um, new claims will extend the duration of the episode, which will remain open whilst care is still being sought for the, uh, for the open condition. An episode is complete in the absence of, of new claims for the uh, condition-specific um, clean period. Um, and the more chronic condition, the, the longer the clean period needs to be. So we start combining the uh, tools to analyze some of the views in terms of, of regional variation. So we start looking at a real-world example, for example, uh, looking specifically at, at tonsillectomies. So we have our, our patient T, who uh, in 2018 consulted a, um, a number of GPs and filled a number of scripts at uh, a number of different pharmacies. So all of these healthcare interactions uh, took place within a reasonably close uh, proximity of each other, um, took place in, a, in a Fofu, which is a rural farming and mining town in Gauteng. And as a result, using our allocation algorithm, the patient is allocated to the primary region of Potchefstroom, which took place in the uh, Clarkstorp tertiary region there. So these slides over here speak to a uh, patient T who visited the, the following year. They visited their, their GP. Um, they were diagnosed with uh, an episode of acute tonsillitis, uh, which triggered a tonsillitis episode of, of care, as we can see up in the top part of the screen there. So a couple pharmacy uh, claims were associated to this episode, and uh, with no further consults, the uh, episode was closed after two weeks. A few months later, uh, patient T was diagnosed with tonsillitis again, um, triggering a second tonsillitis episode. And at this point, patient T is referred to uh, an ENT uh, who confirms the diagnosis and schedules a uh, tonsillectomy procedure which was uh, identified through the use of the DRG grouper. So this is what patient T's journey eventually uh, looks like. He's got his GP consults in his uh, hometown. He's got referral to specialists up there in, in Rudaput. And he's got a hospital admission eventually, which took place in, in Ranfontein. So we can perform these types of uh, analyses at a, at a much deeper and at a much broader level than looking uh, specifically at uh, one particular patient. So using the, uh, the DRG and, and member allocations, uh, we can investigate the admissions per thousand lives, as a way of an example there. So this graph here shows the uh, 2019 admissions, yes, we're on the right slide, per tertiary region. So Cape Town North stands out in terms of their tonsillectomy rates at uh, it was 25.1 admissions, uh, when the average over the period was 11.1. So having a look at the, the 2020 experience, we can see that a, a similar view was, um, was seen in terms of Cape Town North, it does stand out in terms of its uh, tonsillectomy uh, procedures there. And we can see that 
this is the occurrence even in the midst of the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic and lockdowns uh, and the uh, suppressed uh, admission volumes that we, uh, that we saw in 2020. So the anomalous experience uh, 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 continues into uh, 2021 and we saw the admission um, uptake and the number of admissions start to, to increase with Cape Town North standing out with its uh, anomalous experience there again as well. So this anomalous experience translated into an additional 11 and a half uh, admissions per, per thousand lives um, and for um, a scheme of uh, uh, 10 or 100,000 lives it amounts to an additional 115 admissions with a cost of about 1.3 million rand. So using our regional definitions, we can look at the, um, we can analyze the admissions per, per thousand lives at a secondary level for, for Cape Town North. So we've divided it here into our, our secondary regions. Um, and it gives them a better idea of where these additional volumes that we're seeing are, are coming from when comparing Cape Town North to that of the, um, the other tertiary regions. So using the episode grouper, we were able to determine how many tonsillitis uh, uh, um, episodes uh, took place before the actual tonsillectomy. Um, and the orange portion of the bars there is showing um, the proportion of admissions that had no prior episodes of tonsillitis before that tonsillectomy procedure. So when having a look at this graph, we can see that the two sort of, uh, biggest contributors towards the uh, admission volumes within Cape Town North are Kales River and, uh, and Paul, and they appear to be driving the tonsillectomy procedure experience with 65% uh, uh, of the admissions within that region. So almost half the admissions in, in Kales River did not have a prior tonsillitis episode before the tonsillectomy procedure. Uh, you can see it's almost a 50-50 split on that bar there, which was quite unusual when compared to the overall experience. So we saw a large proportion of admissions who had at least one prior episode of, of tonsillitis before being admitted for, for a tonsillectomy. Um, and the experience there in uh, Kales River was uh, anomalous to, uh, to that overall experience. Paul, on the other hand, is a, um, a bigger proportion of, of the admissions, but much more in line with what we would have expected to see in terms of number of tonsillectomy, uh, tonsillectomy procedures after tonsillitis. So about a third of the um, admissions within Paul had at least, um, uh, didn't have any episodes of, of tonsillitis before the tonsillectomy, um, with the remaining two-third had had at least one episode of tonsillitis before going in for the tonsillectomy procedure. So based on these slices and dices and these different views, it might be beneficial at this point in time to have an engagement with ENTs and hospitals uh, within, for example, Kales River, rather than having an upfront engagement with those necessarily in, in Pol, uh, to try and undercover or uncover the, the reasons for the anomalous uh, with a uh, high tonsillectomy rate for those uh, having not had a previous episode of uh, tonsillitis. So moving on to uh, just a summary there and connecting the, uh, the separate pieces. So the conventional uh, reporting uh, and conventional actuarial and statistical reports are a, a starting point. Um, the DRG views add another level to reporting, but only provide details into in-hospital uh, admissions and in-hospital claims. The episode grouper improves on this and uh, provides additional details both in and out of hospital, um, looking at uh, claims from, from both areas there, and allows for claims to be analyzed over periods of time and looks and considers concurrent episodes of care. And then lastly, the uh, regional or the graphical analysis, which can be overlaid uh, on these analysis, uh, completes the picture and allows for actions to be uh, directed at regions or at providers, perhaps, where we see anomalous types of experience. So the regional view provides a couple of additional insights on, on member behavior, um, as well as giving some detail into um, uh, provider referral patterns there as well. So the picture allows for, for high-level details uh, to be derived with some actionable interventions and engagements that can take place as a result of the, uh, the findings um, and actionable interventions that could perhaps be implemented in a more meaningful way with providers. 
Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. I'll pass over to Barry.